Welcome to Hey on Haven. I'm Dawn. Today we're discussing Chapter 9 of the Tale of Genji, Aoi. We'll start with our usual summary for shared context. When His Majesty abdicated, the court changed and the Kokidin faction, led by the Imperial Mother and the Minister of the Right, were now in ascendance. Before he abdicated, he had promoted Genji, and he now asked his son to look after the affairs of the newly appointed heir apparent. When Emperor Suzuku took the throne, a new Saigu, the High Priestess of Ise, was appointed, and the Rokuju lady's daughter was the princess chosen. She was considering going to Ise with her young daughter. The retired emperor, upon hearing this, scolded Genji for treating her poorly. A princess Genji had been pursuing, Asago, hears of the treatment of the Rokuju lady and is determined never to let that happen to her. Genji's wife, Aoi, was now pregnant and suffering from morning sickness and anxiety about the birth. Prayers and rites were performed for her health and to ensure a safe delivery. Genji stops his wanderings. A new Sayin, high priestess of the Kamo Shrine, is appointed. Emperor Suzaku chooses Genji to be among the limited number of courtiers in her procession. With complaints from her gentlewomen and coaxing from her mother, Aoi decides to attend the procession. Her carriages arrived so late that her guards forced other carriages out of the way, including those of her rival, the Rokujo lady, and her pole rests were broken in the fight. Blocked in and unable to leave, she watches as Genji passes by, but he gives her not a glance. She was deeply wounded when she saw his men saluting Aoi's carriages, realizing her place in his heart. Princess Asagao sees Genji for the first time during the procession, but is no more inclined to change their relationship. When Genji hears about the quarrel between the carriages, he feels badly for the Rokujo lady and offended at his wife's behavior, and tries to pay her a visit, but is turned away due to the purification rites for the lady's daughter. A few days later, Genji trims Murasaki's hair, and they attend the Kamo festival together. At the festival, Genji's carriage is called over by Naishi no Suke, who makes space for him. Genji kept his curtains down, and many women resented the unknown lady accompanying him. The Rokujo lady falls ill from worry and obsession. Genji does not try to dissuade her from going to Ise with her daughter. She was in a stressed and depressed state when she went to the procession only to be mistreated, and her state of mind was deteriorating. Meanwhile, Aoi begins suffering from a malignant spirit. Genji refrained from going out in deference to Aoi's delicate condition, and prayers and exorcisms were performed. It seems a living spirit was torturing Aoi, and the whispers that it was either the Rokujo or Nijo ladies began. The Rokujo ladies' resentment grows as Aoi receives kind concern from the court, and she feels jealous and competitive. She becomes so disturbed that she removes herself from her home to prevent polluting her daughter and has Buddhist healing rites performed. Genji visits her, and pleads for her understanding for his neglect, but his morning after letter arrives in the evening full of excuses for not visiting again. The obsessive spirit was appearing more persistently. Rumors swirled that it was either the Rokujo lady's living spirit or her late father's. The Rokujo lady begins having dreams where her living spirit, quite different from herself, torments Aoi, and she begins to believe she is losing her grip on reality. Rites for the High Priestess of Ise, her daughter, continue, and rites and prayers are commissioned for the lady's strange illness. Genji's wife goes into labor unexpectedly. Prayers and rites are performed, and the lady calls out for Genji. Speaking with her, Genji realizes he is speaking to the Rokujo lady's living spirit, possessing his wife, and is horrified. Aoi gives birth to a son. The Rokujo lady hears of the safe delivery and grows agitated. Her clothes reek of exorcist's poppy, and she is disgusted with herself. Feeling guilty for not visiting her, Genji sends a letter, afraid that if he went in person, he would be appalled, wondering how she could have fallen into such a state. The time for autumn appointments arrives, and Genji, the minister of the left, and his brothers-in-law go to the palace, Genji having a long chat with Aoi before leaving. Not long after they had gone, Aoi suffers an attack and dies. Genji spends the first 49 days of the mourning period in seclusion at his father-in-law's Sanjo Villa. The Rokujo lady sends a letter, and she can tell from Genji's reply that he knows it was her living spirit that attacked his wife. Genji writes to Princess Asaga and receives a reply. He asks his wife's attendants to stay with their son. 
they know his visits will be less frequent and are still more upset. After the 49th day, Genji sends a farewell note to his mother-in-law, Princess Omiya, unable to say goodbye in person. His father-in-law goes immediately to see him off, and when looking through Genji's room, finds calligraphy practice in several poems. The minister weeps anew at the loss of his son-in-law. Sometime after the first day of the 10th month, Genji calls on his father, the retired emperor, and then Fujitsubo. He then returns to Nijo to find Murasaki lovelier than ever. Genji cannot bring himself to go out on his usual nocturnal adventures and pretends to be indisposed. Sometime later, he consummates his relationship with Murasaki and formally recognizes her as his wife. Oboro Zugyo can't get Genji out of her mind, and her father was inclined toward the relationship, but the imperial mother, the Kokiden consort, is determined to send her into court service. Genji is fond of Oboro Zugyo, but is not willing to divide his attention between his new bride and anyone else, having learned a fearful lesson from the Rokujo lady, who he can now never recognize as a wife, but he also refuses to abandon her. A coming-of-age ceremony is arranged, and Murasaki's father is informed of the marriage. Murasaki's behavior had changed, and she was full of regret at having trusted Genji. He finds this change to be adorable and regrettable. The chapter closes with New Year's visits to his father, to the emperor, to his secret son, the crown prince, and finally to Sanjo. We're back to a much longer chapter this week, as you could tell from the summary. Let's dive right into the translation differences, starting once again with the title of the chapter. Suematsu translates it to Hollyhock, frequently mistaken for Aoi. Seidenstecker's title is more descriptive, Heartvine. Tyler draws on the connotation of a lover's meeting and translates the title as heart to heart, playing on the heart-shaped leaves of the plant. Washburn more literally translates the title of Aoi to leaves of wild ginger. Speaking of hollyhock, what Suematsu calls the hollyhock fet and the others call the Kamo festival is now known as the Aoi Matsuri and is held in the fourth month, modernly, May 15th. The princess who is sent to Ise is called the Saigu by Suematsu, a Vestal Virgin by Whaley, and High Priestess by Seidenstecker, Tyler, and Washburn. The unmarried princess sent to Kamo was known as the Sain by Suematsu, and the same as her Ise counterpart by the others. Another princess has a difference in moniker. Suematsu calls Princess Asagao, Princess Momozono, Peach Gardens. A footnote in Whaley lets us know that Princess Asagao's father, Genji's uncle, is known as Prince Momozono. And I noticed something odd, a bit of what seems to be flavor text, additional text inserted by Whaley in describing the Rokujo lady, which says, she must face her fate. She had lost Genji forever. None of the other translators have lines similar to this. I think Whaley was inserting his own conclusion. While this chapter covers a decent amount of time, we spend most of it in autumn. Specifically mentioned are autumn appointments sometime before the 20th of the eighth month. When Aoi is cremated, we're told by Seidenstecker that it was late in the eighth month, a quarter moon still hung in the sky that would have brought melancholy thoughts in any case. We hear of cold rains and there are lots of tears and damp sleeves. Suematsu provides an incredibly large footnote explaining the belief that spirits can inflict real world harm and that living spirits sometimes did this out of jealousy and were harder to exercise. After the birth of Genji's son, we're introduced to the term Ubu Yashinai, which are celebrations on the third, fifth, seventh, and ninth nights after a birth. The guests bring gifts in the form of food and clothing for the child. The Rokujo lady's estate is described as having sakaki branches stationed about. Branches of sakaki trees are hung with streamers to mark a place as ritually pure. At one point, the Rokujo lady doesn't reply to a message from Genji because communicating with a person in mourning would pollute her and possibly her home, and she needed to remain ritually pure to assist and stay with her daughter. When she does send him a note, it's on dark blue paper, which Whaley's footnote says was used to correspond with those in mourning. She is described by the three later translators as having her robes, and some also say hair, reek of poppy seeds. Whaley translates this as mustard seeds. Tyler explains in a footnote that poppy seeds were thrown on the sacred goma fire during the rite to quell a spirit. After the 49th day passes, the deceased's possessions are distributed. 
Our translators differ on who did this. Suematsu and Washburn do not specify who. Whaley says that it is Genji, Seidenstecker and Tyler, her father. When Genji visits his father after leaving Sanjo, he presses food on his son, who thinks he has grown very thin. A footnote from Tyler informs us that during the first 49 months, a mourner kept to the plainest food and especially avoided meat and spices. On the subject of food, on Boar's Day, the first day of the boar in the 10th month, mochi, glutinous rice cakes, in the shape of baby pigs is served. There are seven types. Suematsu serves them on a white wood tray, Whaley in an elegant picnic basket. Seidenstecker says that the varied and tastefully arranged foods had been brought in cypress boxes to Murasaki's rooms only, and in a footnote writes that the treats are eaten to ensure good health, and that the boar is also a symbol of fertility. White rice cakes are served on the third night to celebrate the formal acknowledgement of a marriage. These were served on silver plates with silver chopsticks and silver chopstick rests. Our last cultural reference will lead us into clothing. Genji arranges a subdued but impressive ceremony for Murasaki. This is the ceremony of Mogi, according to Suematsu, initiation by Whaley and Seidenstecker, donning of the train by Tyler, and Washburn calls it a coming of age ceremony, when she would, for the first time, put on the pleated back skirt worn by adult women. This is the Mo that we discussed during chapter eight. In this chapter, most of our clothing references revolve around mourning, but we start with the procession for the high priestess of Kamo. Whaley said, the riders in the procession were indeed all magnificently apparelled, each according to his own rank. This would mean that they are in formal court dress. Tyler calls this full civil dress with a formal cloak of a color to match their rank, contrasting train robes, and two pairs of open leg trousers, the inner pair of plain red silk, the outer of brocade. As for the women watching the processions, many dressed in a style which is called Subo Shozoku, according to Suematsu. Whaley says there were among the crowd women of quite good birth who had dressed in walking skirts and come a long way on foot. Seidenstecker describes veiled ladies of no mean rank, who Tyler refers to as quite respectable women in deep hats, calling out Subo Shozoku in a footnote. Subo Shozoku, the attire for a respectable woman outdoors. She draped a shift over her head and hair, then put on a deep, broad-brimmed hat. She also hitched up her skirts a little for walking, and continues in the footnote to say, women too modest and standing for Subo Shozoku would still tuck their hair under their outer robe when outdoors. Washburn says that ladies of rank wore veils beneath their deep-brimmed hats for the sake of modesty. This outfit is one that I have a lot of experience with, as it's the one that I sewed by hand for an earlier competition. At the procession, we have another instance of ladies' sleeves and hems peeking out from beneath blinds in conspicuous displays. I'm grateful to a friend for reminding me that the term for this, ida shuginu, meaning putting out one's robes, can be found in Liza Dalby's kimono fashioning culture. Just before Genji takes Murasaki to the Kamo festival, he looks over all her playmates. Their dainty tresses were trimmed so as to hang neatly over their diapered holiday gowns. That was Whaley. Seidenstecker says that they are wearing embroidered trousers. Tyler says that they are damask patterned outer trousers. And we have another fan. At the Kamo festival, while trying to find a place for his carriage, a fan is used to beckon Genji over. Suematsu omits this detail. Whaley states, one of the ladies handed him a fan with the corner bent down. Seidenstecker says that the lady wrote a reply on a rib of a tastefully decorated fan. Tyler and Washburn say she broke off part of her decorated fan to write on. This particular fan is the wooden slat fan known as a hiyogi. When Genji goes into Aoi, just before she gives birth, her hair and clothing are described. All our translators agree that she was wearing white. Whaley says she is wearing a white jacket, in a footnote calling it a lying-in jacket and loose sick room garb. Suematsu says that her long tresses were unfastened, but Whaley describes the plaited tresses of her long hair. This strikes me as wrong. A braid seems wrong. I know that long hair was frequently dressed with white paper hair ties, tied in multiple places along the length of a low ponytail. But plaited or tied up hair is the opposite of Suematsu's unfastened hair. And Seidenstecker notes that her hair was bound on one side. Washburn says her hair was pulled back and tied up and she was wearing maternity robes. 
so Suematsu's unfastened hair is the outlier this time. When talking with the living spirit of the Rokuju lady through Aoi, she tells Genji to bind the hems of her robe. A footnote from Seidenstecker says this binds an errand spirit. Genji chats with Aoi before leaving her to go to court, and Weili describes her hair as every ringlet in its right place. It's obvious Weili knew very little about the period's hairstyles. And now we move into the descriptions of mourning clothes. Suematsu describes mourning robes of a dull color. When Genji is brought his light gray mourning dress, he realizes that if Aoi had outlived him, she would be wearing clothing of a darker shade. Tyler lets us know that a widow's mourning period was a full year, while a widower's was only three months. On the first day of the 10th month, clothing and furnishings are changed over to winter. Tono Chujo uses the opportunity to lighten the gray of his mourning dress as he changes into winter robes. Genji, however, remains in summer garments according to custom. He wears a gray noshi over a red garment. Seidenstecker calls it a singlet, which Whaley translates as a different garment, a colored sash. This streak of red showed up against his gray cloak, which though still a summer one, was of a darker color than that which he had lately been wearing. Tyler says the red garment is scarlet, and that Kurinai, scarlet, could be worn under relatively light mourning. When Genji speaks to Aoi's gentlewoman before leaving his father-in-law's villa, a little girl is described. Whaley calls her Little Miss Ate and puts her in a short tunic, darker than the dresses the others were wearing, with a black neckerchief and dark blue breeches. Seidenstecker names her Ateki and describes her outfit as a tiny singlet, a very dark gray, and her black cloak and straw-colored trousers. Tyler's translation is very similar to Seidenstecker, but in a footnote goes further and writes, she has on akome, often worn by little girls, under kazami, a girl's formal dress gown. Washburn calls her Atekimi and describes her trousers as orange-brown. Genji makes visits to his father in Fujitsubo after leaving Sanjo. He is wearing an unpatterned robe and a gray singlet, the ribbons of his cap tied up in mourning. That's Seidenstecker. Tyler and Washburn say these ribbons are rolled up. In contrast to the weeping gentlewoman at Sanjo, dressed in shades of gray, the servants at his Nijo villa are dressed to the nines to welcome Genji back after his long absence. Seidenstecker says that the furnishings and everyone's dress have been changed to welcome autumn, but this is after the first day of the 10th month, so it's actually winter. During his New Year's visit to Sanjo, Genji is presented with fresh clothing of a most unusual pattern and mixture of colors and did not at all please him. Our other translators are more gentle in Genji's feelings toward this gift from his former mother-in-law. In fact, Tyler's take is nearly the opposite. The exquisite items that accompanied this message joined the others already on the frames. In color and workmanship, the train robe she wished him to have was so exceptional that he knew he could not let it go unappreciated, and he put it on. And Washburn, too, saying the color and weave of his robe and train were exceptional. Whaley frequently gets the clothing wrong, so I wonder about his color translations, as they differ so much from the other translators. Seidenstecker and Washburn also seem to miss the mark occasionally, but Tyler seems that he just, in general, has a more clear understanding of the clothing. What stood out for you in this chapter? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for Chapter 10, Sakaki, the Sacred Tree. Subscribe if you'd like to explore the Heian period of Japan with me through the tale of Genji.